Right. We started a new, a new subject matter this week. It's called Up to Something. Uh, I, I like this. Now, I'd like to put uh, God is up to something only because then we can use the uh, an acronym GUTS, right? God is up to something. <clears throat> That's a preacher thing. Just, just trust me with that. God is up to something. And, and, and the basic premise behind this is simply our setbacks are God's setups. It's just the, that's the, pem- the premise, that, that when we experience setbacks, how is God involved? How is God engaged? What is God up to? Amen. Because for many of us, that's our problem. When we get into our conflicts, when we get into our struggles, when we get into our adversities, when we get into the stuff that doesn't make sense to us, right, when we get into the things that we weren't praying about and has happened anyhow, yeah. or that we were praying against and it happened anyhow, Right, or we were believing opposite of what actually took place. Anybody ever been there? Come on, that's the reality of the spiritual life. There's five of you. The rest of y'all lying? <laughs> You're lying, I'm telling you. Anyhow, but, but the reality is, is that that's the reality of our Christian experience. And so the question is, is God not listening to us? Is there a flaw in our theology? Or is there something wrong with us? And I think that the real, the real question isn't any of that, because some of these things we'll never understand, right? Some, some of these things we will never understand the nuance. You've got to wait to get to heaven to figure that out. The question is, is if God delays, and Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, if you, it, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but he says, if you don't find the relief you're looking for when you're looking for it, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? In other words, when I'm not getting my expectations met, Will I still believe him? Will I still trust him? Do I still have a confidence that God is up to something? Now, now there's a famous verse that many of you already know, but I'm going to share it with you because it's really kind of the backdrop to all that we're going to be sharing with you over the next couple of weeks. And it's simply the Romans 8.28 declaration, right? For we know. Now, this is important. The we know means we have an intimate understanding of this. We know that God causes now, we love that because we like to blame God for everything, and we don't like to accept responsibility for anything, right? So if I'm in a mess, it's not because I made a bad decision, or I sinned, or I, bro- I messed up, right? It's because God, God's disappointing me. God's not meeting my expectations. And folks, that's the world we live in in America. It's always somebody else's fault. But we know that God causes, we like, now we, all right, so God caused this. That's not what this verse is saying. God causes everything to work. So he didn't cause the, he didn't cause the event, but he causes what the event could do to you to be turned to good. But there's a caveat. There's a condition that has to be met. For those who love God and are called or aligned with his purposes. So, so if I don't love God, I can't blame God for him not helping me with this. And if I'm not aligned with his purposes, even if, I'm, even if I love God, if I'm not aligned with his purposes, I can't expect the fulfillment of this verse. Now, you don't have to say amen, or you don't have to, well, you know, you can do an oh me. That might fit really well. And so, and so we want to talk about this with something very significant. Here's a word that every one of us need to embrace in our walk with God. This is a word that we all need to fully grab a hold of and bear hug. You ready? Yes. Say the word through. through. Mm-hmm. Because through is God's plan. He didn't say escape. He didn't say not experience. No, through is God's plan. I'll prove it to you. This is one verse of many. Isaiah 43, verse one, it says, but now, O Jacob, this is basically the people of God, listen to the Lord who what? Created you. The one who what? formed you, he created you, he formed you, and here's his proclamation to you, do not be afraid, I have ransomed you, I bought you back, I have called you by your name, what is your name? You are mine. Okay? And then the next verse, when you go, 
Come on, when you go, when you go deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk, oh, come on, is somebody getting the idea? When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. So today I want to talk about getting through the fire. Because I promise you, you're going to go through deep waters. I promise you, you're going to go through floods. I promise you, you're going to experience fires of oppression. Because God said, when you go through, that, that, that is a statement of fact. It's not a, this might happen, so be prepared. No, it's going to happen. So all you faith people are having a real hard time with what I'm telling you. Now, he didn't say when you might go through. He said when you walk through. <laughs> He's got a promise. You'll not be burned up. You won't be consumed by it. Now, I can tell you that if you ever make your journey, if you ever make your journey a stop, the flames will consume you. You have to continue to get through. You don't, you don't stop in the midst. Come on. Has anybody ever here walked on coals of fire? I don't think you want to stop. I don't think you want to start walking and just say, you know, this is really nice. I'll just stand here for a minute or two. And what do we do when we get into the fires? I just can't believe I'm here. I, God, I'm done with you. <laughs> and we're laying there in an ash heap and wondering why God disappointed us. And God says, keep walking. Keep walking. Keep determining to go through. Now, that's not my message. I'm just introducing some ideas. Right? So when you go through. So I'm going to use an individual that, that is going to identify this through principle for us. Okay? Because if God's up to something, we have to make a commitment to through. We can't, have a, we can't make a commitment to stay in our pain, to stay in our trauma, to stay in our hurt, to stay in our grief, to stay in our fear. Come, I, it was interesting. I was talking to somebody. I'm not going to tell you who it was. But I was talking to somebody yesterday, and they were having some problems. And, and I, I'm a fan of chiropractic. Some people aren't, but I am. And I said, and they were telling me, I, I said, well, have you ever considered chiropractic for your condition? And they said, uh, he's, they, they said well, I'm afraid of chiropractors. What do you think? I said, well, I think you should stay in fear and pain. <laughs> because the advice every pastor would give you, yeah, I think you should remain in fear. <laughs> you got to go through you got to go through. And, and so, and so when, I, when we think about these contexts, right, we have to think about this commitment. I don't want to stay in my pain. Right? I don't want to stay in my sin. I don't want to stay in my dysfunction. I don't want to stay in my anger. I got to go. Life is designed to go through it. And that's where God's commitment to us is. God's commitment to us is in the through, not the stay. Because you're going to have, come on, Jesus even said, it, Luke, Luke 17, he said, it's impossible that no offenses will come. You're going to be offended. Now you've got to make a decision with offense. Am I going to stay in offense? Let the seeds of bitterness grow in my spirit? Or am I going to make a decision to go through my offense? The problem with us, many of us don't understand, or we reject God's principles for moving through. And we stay stuck. And when we stay stuck, 
We get alienated when we stay stuck. We get grief stricken when we stay struck. We get consumed, just like stopping on that journey of the fiery coals. So I'm going to talk about Moses. Moses is a great example. So go to Exodus chapter 2. This is going to be the start of anything. Now, now I want to just frame the Moses journey. We're only going to take the first couple of chapters. So I'm only going to preach two chapters this morning. How many feel really comfortable that we will only be here a short time? <laughs> so, so think about this. Uh, Moses, Moses is born into a culture that rejects him simply because of his race. He's a Jew. Not only is he a Jace, they also reject him because of his gender. He could be a Jew and be a girl and be okay. But he can't be a Jew and be a boy. Does it sound something like our generation, our world? Doesn't matter what, you know, sometimes it matters whether you're a man or you're a woman, depending on whether you're slighted or slated to survive. Sometimes it depends on your race, whether you're, I'm not going to get into it, but I just want you to see that this isn't a new event. This isn't a new political or cultural environment. These environments have existed for centuries, for generations, for millennia. And so here he is, he's born into this. Now he has nothing to do with this. He's just a child being born. And, And there's a strategy for his demise at the moment of his birth. He comes out of the safest place in the world, the mother's womb, or what is supposed to be the safest place in the world, and he falls into the hands of a midwife who has been commissioned by the king to slaughter him at that moment. And not just slaughter him, but he's there to take him, not kill him at the stool, but to actually take him to the river and throw him in the river, throw him into deep waters. Because deep waters will kill you, just like fire will kill you. So they're going to throw him into waters. Well, well, when this baby is born, the midwives don't commit, not just with Moses, but with all the male children, they commit that they're not going to do it. They're not going to align. And so when the king confronts them, when the Pharaoh confronts them and says, why aren't you doing what I told you to do? They said, man, these, these Hebrew women, man, they, I, by, by the time they call us, they've already had the babies. And they've already hidden them because they know about your edict. And so, and so uh, we just, they're lively. That's the word they use. I think that's appropriate. They're, they're having babies. I mean, boom, boom, boom. They're just coming. And so, and so the, the Pharaoh, uh, you know, kind of ignores that and says, well, now we're just going to gather the children and my, and my soldiers are going to gather anybody under two years old and we're, gonna, we're either going to slaughter them, we're going to throw them in the river. That's what we're going to do. Well, Moses is born in this environment. So he's born into a culture that already wants to eradicate him. And I'm here to tell you, we're born into a world that doesn't want us to see our potential, doesn't want us to see our destiny, doesn't want us to see what God wants to mine out of our lives. We're born into a world that wants, that the enemy's plan is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's the whole context of what he wants to do. But I'm here to tell you, no matter what the enemy's strategies is, no matter what the cultural strategies are, no matter what the economic or social strategies are, God has a plan for your life. And so they, they, he, he takes them, and, and, and we all know that after a few months, you know, they, they, Moses is hidden because he's considered a, a, a beautiful child, a unique child, an extraordinary child. And, and then what happens is he's, he's too, getting too old, he's getting too fussy, getting too loud. They can't hide him anymore. And so because there's a command to throw him into the river, she fulfills the command, the mother, by getting a basket of bulrushes, we all know the story, uh, making it basically a little mini ark. And then the Bible says it's placed in the reeds, and it's placed strategically. I'm telling you a story, you can read it. It's in Exodus chapter 1 and 2. And, and she places it strategically near the enemy's camp, near a place where Pharaoh's daughter and her maidens will oftentimes find refreshing near basically a bathhouse. And so sure enough, when Pharaoh's daughter comes down, she sees the ark in this cluster of bulrushes or reeds, which, if, which in their mind, it's been captured by these reeds, that she sends a maiden, the maiden comes, grabs the basket, opens it up, the baby's crying, and immediately her heart softens towards her enemy. And the sister, Moses' sister, who later on is we know is Miriam, 
sees this, runs up to the Pharaoh's daughter and says, hey, you know, I, I know you're not prepared. We, can we provide a wet nurse for you? Can we provide somebody that can, that can you know, nurse the child? And she said, yeah, go, go take the child, find somebody to nurse him, and I'll take care of the child from that day forward. Are you with me? So here's the, here's the principle. The principle is, is that she goes and gets Moses' mama. And now what happens is Moses' Moses's mama is nursing her son, and this can take up to two to three years, nursing her son, and she's getting paid for it. It's the idea of surrender and return. If I can give up what God gives me, he'll give it back to me, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Come on, somebody. But some of us in the midst of our environment, well, God gave me this. Isn't this what God required of Abraham? That I want you to surrender what I've given to you? And if you'll surrender what I've given to you, I'll return it back to you in a better place, in a better condition. And too many of us, that's why we struggle with giving, right? Well, this is mine. No, it ain't yours. It's what God gave you. And if I can surrender what he's given to me, guess what he does? He multiplies it, brings it back, and gives you some interest on top. That's the way it works. So it starts, if I'm going to get through, if I'm going to get through, if I'm going to experience the up to something thing, it's sometimes going to demand of me to let go of the thing that's most precious to me. And to trust God with the very thing that he already gave me. Trust him with it again. And I can't tell you how many mothers, fathers, people I've, I've run into, they said, well, I just believe God gave it to me. I don't understand why I have to give it up. Because the issue isn't the thing. The issue is the faith. That God is always constantly growing, developing, and bringing us to a new place of faith. Now, now Moses is patriated back into Pharaoh's family. He becomes basically a type of prince within the home of Pharaoh. And he's raised up, but he also now has this deep connection to the Jewish people because he was being nursed by his mother for up to, what, three, four years possibly. And so he's got this ingrained identity with the people of Israel because I'm telling you, she just wasn't doing a judicious job of doing her job of taking care of this baby. She was what? She was speaking into that baby. She was giving that baby the word. She was singing the Psalms and the songs and she was declaring and communicating the realities of Jehovah God. Are you with me? And so when she put him back into that environment, now he's being indoctrinated in the ways of Egypt. He's being indoctrinated into the polytheism that exists in that culture. He's being indoctrinated and experiencing all the refinements and all the blessings and all the abundance that comes with being a part of a king's family. And look what happens. Now the setback step, the setback happens. And here's the setback. He's walking along. He's a younger man. He's probably, you know, he's probably in his mid to late 30s, 40s. And as he's doing this, he's early, late 30s probably, and he's, he's walking along and he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. Now, this would be a common experience in that culture. This would not be something he hadn't seen before. This is something that has been consistently, and his, his heart aches every time he sees it. He's anguished inside every time he sees it. His personal sense of justice is growing with every one of these events that he sees. And then what happens? He looks to the right, and he looks to the left. He says, is anybody else watching? And when that Egyptian is done beating that Hebrew, and as he's walking down a dark alley, going back to his house... Moses sneaks up behind him and kills him, then drags him into the sand and buries him. This doesn't sound like a future preacher. <laughs> but he kills him and then he buries him. And then he goes about his day. He thinks he can repatriate. He thinks he can become the first Batman. <laughs> I'm going to execute justice and nobody's going to know who I am. 
And God will put the bat light up in the sky, the Moses light. And I'm going to run to the rescue, and I'm going to do it in the shadows, and, and I'm going to execute justice. Well, the very next day, he sees two Hebrews fighting each other. And this one Hebrew's beating up this other one. And, and, and he goes to them and he starts breaking them up. He says, come on, you guys are brothers. What are you doing? <laughs> and the one Hebrew looks at him and said, what are you going to do? You going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Did you post that on Facebook? <laughs> right? So here's where the setup happens. So he then finds out that Pharaoh's heard about it. And he realizes, and Pharaoh's going to take him to the chopping block because you can't kill an Egyptian citizen, especially for a Hebrew, and get away with it. And so Pharaoh shoots. He runs to the desert to get away from the edict of Pharaoh and from the embarrassment and the shame. It's a setback. And here's why the setback happens. He stands up for what's right instead of what's acceptable. Right? He, sets, he stands up. And he trusts God for what's right instead of what's acceptable. And the consequence of that falls on his head. Now, the problem isn't that he stood up for what was right. Come on, we live in a world where people only want to get along sometimes. And if you don't agree with them, then you're just rejected. We live in that culture. And Moses is in this world where he's trying to find this place of justice. And he knows it's necessary because there's a lot of injustice all around him. But here's the problem. He did the wrong thing. Motivated by his own sense of justice. In other words, he did the wrong thing because he allowed his own experience to inform what his justice should be. And that's why the Bible tells us vengeance is mine. I will repay. Because too many of us would operate on our own informed experience and we would execute people that God would save. And we would destroy people that God would restore. And this is a setback because of his own decisions, based on his own sense of justice, he's done something horrible, and now he has been alienated from everything. He's not only alienated from Egypt, he's not only alienated from his comfort, what? He ran from the consequences of his actions. He surrendered all of his position, all of his comfort. He surrendered his identity. He is now alone, entirely alone in life. And whose fault is it? It's his and his alone. And where does he escape to? He escapes to the only safe place for him. He escapes to anonymity normalcy and convenience. He's just going to be a shepherd working for his father-in-law. He's not even going to have his own tent, his own sheep, his own flock. He's nothing more than a hired hand. He's gone from prince status, avenger of righteousness status, to zero status. And it's a world he's going to have to be comfortable with because he can never engage or become greater because if he does, he'll become a target. Look at what it says. Look at, I love this. Then Moses was content. He was content to live with the man and he gave Zipporah his daughter to Moses and she bore him a son. He called his name Gershom for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. He, he realized this isn't my world. This is a world I'm, I don't even live in. I'm a stranger here. But I was forced here by my own setbacks. Now, I don't know what setbacks you've experienced in life. Maybe it was a, maybe it was a diagnosis from a doctor. Maybe it was a, a, a layoff you weren't expecting. Maybe you got fired and you did deserve it. No, ain't nobody amen to me there. <laughs> right? Maybe, maybe, maybe it's because you had a little bit too much wine and you're in a jail because you decided to drive because you weren't drunk by your own estimation. 
I just have an itch. <laughs> right? And, and, and we're in this setback. And now what am I going to do? Now I've got my whole life has changed. The whole direction, the whole trajectory of my life is now completely different than what I thought it would be. I graduated from college with a degree in Renaissance art, and I don't understand. <laughs> why I'm working at McDonald's. <laughs> okay, Pastor, let's move on. But what, what's the premise of our series? God's up to something, right? That our setbacks are setups. And so now we're going into a setup moment. So I want to start in verse 1 of chapter 3, and we're going to read it. You guys were wondering when I was actually going to read some scripture. Here we go. One day Moses was tending the flock of who? His father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord, now whenever you see this language of the angel of the Lord, uh, you're going to find out later it's not an angel, it's actually God himself manifesting appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? i got to go see this. Moses, Moses makes a decision to move towards the fire. He's in a deserted place, and he's seeing a unique thing. He doesn't know how to translate. Now, now we, get, we get to understand it because the Bible gives us context, but let's understand. This is a man meandering through the mountains. He has a faint remembrance of his mother's words. Now, he's close to 80 years old now. How many would say that's a lifetime? It is a lifetime. He spent 40 years in luxury thinking he was somebody, he spent the last 40 years realizing he's nobody. And at the end of an 80-year period of life, he's seeing something he has never seen in his 80 years. And he doesn't know it's God. He just sees this as a phenomenon. He, he doesn't have a context because we know that because later on he says, who are you? And who should I say is sending me? He has no context for knowing who this is or what this is. So he, in just basic interest, something that is changing the context of his everyday experience, he goes to this burning bush and he stands in front of a fired, a fire that is not consuming the bush. Now listen, Moses is in isolation. And insulation. And in this isolation and insulation, what happens? He confronts God in a symbol of himself, a thorn bush. Now, I want you to see this because this is really kind of the premise of what I want you to see. see you see, Moses was a picture of survival. And every, I've lived in the desert for many, many years, and I can tell you there is nothing in the desert that doesn't have a thorn. Nothing in the desert doesn't have a thorn. A briar, a thistle, nothing is sweet and tender and precious. Everything there is made to defend itself. And here he is in a desert place and he sees a bush and it's not just a kind of a gentle little precious shrub. This is a bush that is filled with thorns because that's what the desert is. And Moses is in the plate. Come on. Moses is a bush. He's a thorny man because he's lived in a desert place, isolated, alone, and dry. He has no context. He has no sense of who he is. And listen, and this fire is the passion that he once knew for justice. This fire is the, the thing that was the, the focus of why he even killed that man. I have this passion to see justice. I have this passion to see righteousness. I have this passion to see a people not be oppressed anymore. But he's long lost his passion, and he's just looking at some sheep 
that aren't even his. And he's living in a house that isn't even his. He has no identity and no context. And God says, I'm going to flip the script on you. I'm about to set you up, young man, because here's what's happening. I'm going to manifest myself in the thing that represents who you are. Here's a question. What makes you prickly? Oh, yeah. And if you don't know, ask your wife. And if you don't know, ask your husband. Or if you don't know, ask your friends. What makes you unapproachable? What makes you painful to interact with? What puts you in a position where nothing wants to grow around you and nothing wants to approach you? Maybe it's your unjust experiences. Maybe it's your rejection. Maybe it's your pain. Maybe it's your guilt. Maybe it's it's insignificance, this sense that I don't have any value. Maybe, Maybe you become prickly because you've lost some opportunities or you're alone or you're disappointed or whatever. It's amazing how many prickly Christians I've met. They're usually the one that's sitting in the middle of the room and nobody is within two seats of them. Thankfully, that's not here. That's not true here. Because, listen, the picture of survival, this thorn-laden bush still had a fire in the middle of them to confront the injustice. And God says, I'm going to change. I'm going I'm to direct. I'm going to become the passion for your injustice. And you're going to relate to it not based on your own experiences, but based on my righteousness. The question is, what makes you prickly? And then, what fires us up? You see, Moses had to confront the fire as from the Lord, and not himself or his circumstances. See, Moses had to confront the fire, the passion. I don't want my personal identity, my personal sense of justice, my personal experience, or my personal uh, circumstances to determine my passions. I want God. Now, God will use those things, but I want God to be the fire in the midst of me. I want God to be the thing that ignites my soul. Because when God, listen, if it's just my passion, my passion will consume me. But if it's God that is my passion, it won't consume me. Come on, if God becomes my passion, then, come on, I'm burning, but it isn't consuming me. It's bringing heat and life and light, but it isn't consuming me. But when it's my passion, it's consuming me, and it's consuming, I'll burn out. You see, the fire represents our passion, our process of purity and our tempering. Are you listening? See, passion, fire is a great representation of, and what did, what did God say uh, through, through the prophet John the Baptist when he said, when he that comes after me, who's mightier than me, whose sandals I can't even carry, what's he going to immerse you in? What's he going to baptize you with? He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire because my setups come on my setups are when God takes my setbacks and gives me a different a reoriented passion a redirected passion a passion that won't burn me out a passion that won't destroy me and we see people today they've got a passion for the party lifestyle and it's destroying them. They got a passion for, for hedonism and sleeping around and sexuality and it's destroying them. They got a passion for their career and it's destroying their families and it's removing their peace and their connectivity in life. Come on, we're seeing people that are being destroyed because of their passions. But God says, if you'll let me be your passion. And he's trying to, he's given, he's given Moses the opportunity to understand that I want to fire you up. I want to put a passion in you. And not just a passion, but I want to, in that passion, I want to purify you. I want to temper you. How many know it's the fire that forges us? It's the fire that gives us the ability to be truly a sword in the hand of the Lord. Where I don't bend, I don't break, I don't get chipped in the conflicts of life. 
It's how fire engages our life. It's how we relate to the pressures and the pain of life. So here's what I want to do. Will you give me a few minutes to do this? I want you to discover God in the fire. I want you to discover God in the fires of your isolation, in the fires of your setback. Let's understand that he's been in his setback for 40 years. And some of you have been in your setback for years. And you can sit here and say, it's too long, it's been too much, it's too much time has passed, there's no way out of this. I want you to discover God, come on, I want you to discover God in the bush. I want you to see yourself as the bush and I want you to see God as the fire. And I want you to discover Christ in you, the hope of glory. So let's go to verse four. Look at this. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush. Now this is your first idea. This is not some phenomenon. This is not some natural thing. This isn't something that lightning struck. Or this is a, you know, I've, I've heard some theologians and commentators say, well, that bush was a certain fiery bush that exists within the desert regions and it blooms like fire. You think Moses, after 40 years in the desert, doesn't know that? Come on, he knows the difference between a natural bush and a bush that's actually on fire and isn't being consumed. And so what does he do? When the bush starts talking, you probably ought to start listening. And it isn't going, feed me, Seymour. It ain't doing that. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush. Moses, Moses. Ha <laughs> ha. Not only is he talking, but he knows me. Here am I, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Here's the very, you want to discover God in the fire? Here's the first thing. You need to know that he knows your name. And that he's going to call your name in the midst of your fire. In other words, he's identifying your name. When he's identifying your name, he's identifying your destiny. He's identifying your purpose. He's identifying that he's never disconnected from you. He's identifying that he still wants to engage you. He's declaring to you, I have not been absent. I have not been re- reminisce. I have not been in, 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 non-engaged. I have been fully engaged. And now I'm calling you to a place where you are going to become everything that I have called you to become since the very beginning. Listen, it is, it is here. It is here we discover that God knows, first of all, who we are. He also knows what we are, and he knows who we are supposed to be. And I'm here to tell you that when you confront God, he's going to confront. He knows where you are, because some of you disqualify yourself because you know your weaknesses, you know your frailties, you know where you've broken down, you know where you've made mistakes. He knows what you've done, and it's okay. He knows you killed somebody 40 years ago. He knows you've been in isolation for 40 years. You know that you had a bad experience in church 20 years ago and you just are never going to serve again because you don't want to get hurt again. God knows all this stuff. I was married once, but that was a bad situation. I'll never love again. He knows what you've done. He knows where you've been. But he also, come on, when he calls your name, that means he's calling you to something. He knows where you're supposed to be. Not only that, but listen, we can't approach the fire as we always have. How do you approach the fire before? He, when I say approach the fire, I mean live in the fire. He, he, he engaged it. He activated himself. It was all about how he was to fulfill himself. But now he realizes I can't approach this the way I would approach any fire. I've got to humble myself. And I have to identify with God in the flames. I gotta kick my shoes off and I gotta bury my face in the ground because this isn't a normal situation. I know this is a nor- this was a normal day until just a few minutes ago. 
But now everything's changed, and I gotta humble myself. I gotta take off my shoes, and I gotta fall on my face. I've gotta identify with God in a new way. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and in due season, in due season, in due time, as you move through, he will exalt you. When you identify God in the flames, here's what he does. God gives us our identity, our legacy, and affirms his promise. Look at, look at. Do you know that right here, right here, he gives us our identity. He said what? He said, I'm the God of your father. He didn't even know who his father was. I'm the God of your father. Your father's Abraham. Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. Do you realize that Moses was caught between three worlds? Three cultural identities? He was an Egyptian for 40 years. He was a Midianite for 40 years. And he had a small sliver of time with his mama where his natural genetic code plus that little bit of influence in those formidable years, told him he was a Jew. And listen, what did he name his son? Gershom. I'm a foreigner. I'm a stranger in a foreign land. He couldn't identify with the Egyptians. He couldn't identify with the Midianites. He couldn't even identify with the Israelites. He had no format to identify with any group. You ever been there? You ever been the kid, you didn't really relate to the cowboys, and you didn't really relate to the, you know, the goths, and you didn't really relate to the jocks, and you didn't really relate to the, to the, I don't know what you'd call them, the nerds. <laughs> Thank you. Couldn't relate, couldn't relate to the drug heads. You know, you couldn't relate to whatever the subcultures were. And you're like walking around, I don't belong, I don't belong, I don't belong. And we got kids today, I don't belong, I don't belong, I don't belong. And they shoot themselves. Or they overdose. Because they find themselves cult, uh, they find themselves in this cultural maze where they don't know who they are. And and you'd, you'd think they could find it in their families, but their families are broken too. Their mama's been buried three times, their daddy's... Never been involved. Come on, listen, folks. It's not, it's not true for everybody, but it's certainly true for many. And we wonder why we live in a culture that just doesn't know how to relate to anybody. And so everybody's in their own little pocket and saying, if you don't agree with me, that hurts me. But Moses was caught in this world. And what did God do? I love this. God said, I'm going to give you your identity. You are an Israelite. I am the God of your fathers. Your fathers are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I made a promise to them, and I'm going to fulfill it through you. And I'm calling you to a new place, and I'm calling you to a new thing. Because I want you to know that now Moses is going to confront the fire, and the fire is going to transform his life. And the fire, as he moves through that fire, he begins to identify who God is. He begins to realize the grace that God's put on his life. Later on, come on, he says, I can't do this. I, I can't speak. It's now not about identity. It's now about ability. I can't do this now. And what does God say? No, no, you don't have to worry about it. I'll give you a mouthpiece. Uh, but you're going to take that stick uh, that has identified your languishing and your wandering and your isolation, and you're going to deliver my people because of it and through it. Uh, when you can't speak, I'll let somebody else speak for you. But I want you to know that you are my man. You are my choice. I'm changing everything in your world. And he went through the fire. This wouldn't be his only fire. There's going to be a fire on Mount Sinai. There's going to be a fire over his head for 40 years. But I want you to take, I want to take you back to Isaiah. I wish I could tell you my story. I don't have time. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you says, do not be afraid. I've ransomed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you go, when you go, Through deep waters, I'll be with you. When you go 
through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. And when you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned. The flames will not consume you. Because I'm here to tell you right now, God is up to something. He's up to something good. Even in the middle of your fire, he's up to something good. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to awaken our spirits, awaken our hearts. Lord, identify the great grace and glory that you're wanting to pour out over this people today. Lord, I pray that you would stir our spirits to a new, higher, better, glorious thing that will transform every one of our lives. Father, I I know there are people in this room that are in the fire right now. They're going through it. They're confronting these things that looks like they could consume them, but instead, you want to speak to them through it. You want to give them identity through it. You want to show them their mission through it. You want to empower them through it. And Lord, today I pray that you would awaken hearts and you would establish spirits and you would quicken us to trust the great work you're doing right now all around this room. Lord, for those that are online right now, I pray that you would just penetrate the fires of their adversities and show them, Lord, that even when things don't seem to be working for them, you're working with them. Lord, I'm trusting you for a miracle. I'm, try, I'm trusting you for miracles of reset and reorientation, transformation, even today, in Jesus' name. Stand to your feet all over the room. God bless you.